course, one of the new normals we've become accustomed to are hybrid events. So once again, a very big thank you for joining us virtually today, while our guests join us both in studio and online. This Leading Edge Insights series is brought to you by Liberty Corporate. Up next, I'm pleased to welcome Liberty Corporate's own Bram Nadir and Tembi Mavuso. Welcome to you both. Thanks so much for joining us today. So there's no denying that turbulent times are very much still with us. Uh, but as we heard in Zandile's op, uh, update when it comes to leveraging off opportunity, nevertheless, as we heard when we chatted to Andrew about his approach at Food Lovers Market and then Lebo's positivity as well, there are ways to leverage off opportunity even in challenging times. Bram, do you agree? I think absolutely, Alicia. I think it has been an incredibly difficult time, as we're all aware, but it is really around all of us and we've seen it with our customer base. I mean, you refer to, to Andrew and Lebo, but frankly, even Liberty itself as an employer and as a provider thinking, how do we navigate this and how do we actually make the most of it? Yeah. So an absolute necessity in this changing world. How do we make the most of it? So let's get into some of the granular details here, Tembi, because uh, we need to know for our viewers joining us online, engaged with us in this conversation today, what do they need to know to make an impact in their businesses from today? So I would um, take something about what Zandi said. You can see collaboration is a big key, a big theme that if you can find within your organization teams that can collaborate or even um, similar businesses to yourself to see how you can leverage off each other. But then also important is to be agile because as we've seen during and post the pandemic, that's just how you can be able to identify those opportunities in the chaos yeah. to be agile. It's a difficult one to navigate and get around though, because that line is very blurred, right? What's competition and what's collaboration? It is, and I think what a lot of companies have learned, I mean, and it's not only during the pandemic, I think it preceded that, but you can actually sometimes cooperate with your competition. There are sometimes areas where, you know, competitors can collaborate. But obviously, you know, there are other areas where I think one's going to be very careful for all companies, you know, what is your, your sort of true value proposition and, and look at that very, very carefully and, and sort of compete on, on that angle. Yeah. But when it comes to that, Bram, what's Liberty Corporate's position or approach to solutions it's putting on the table for its clients right now? No, I think, Alicia, I mean, our, our sort of we've given a lot to of thinking to what really is our, our, our core proposition. And I think we really ended up on one simple philosophy, and that is we absolutely have to walk the, walk the walk with our clients. You know, we have to be there for our employers because they most, and I think it came out very clearly in, in Lebo and Andrew's comments, the most valuable asset for mm. most, if not all businesses, is their human capital. And, you know, we like to believe we play a critical role in that and helping employers you know, give a better employee value proposition to their employees. And we want to be, and we believe we are a, a critical partner to employers in that endeavor. But with all I've been reading up to today, it seems like regulatory changes are going to be a significant, uh, you know, challenge or obstacle to kind of overcome and uh, uh, navigate here. What's on everybody's lips regarding the regulatory changes that are to come? Yeah, I think that's been, you know, probably across the world, but certainly in South Africa, you know, we know sort of regulation has been a massive issue and it's, it's not a recent thing. It's been coming the last 10 years. Um, we've seen big things like, like T-Day, et cetera, that have made some big changes in South Africa, certainly around retirement savings. The reality is retirement savings it remains a massive challenge in South Africa. We do know that, you know, there's a savings crisis. I think the really big thing that's really come about the last probably six months, but to be honest, it's, it's becoming a little bit longer, is the whole issue around preservation. And, you know, we know this is the one thing that we've really struggled to get right in South Africa. It's a big contributor to the savings crisis. And it's the fact that people generally don't preserve for retirement when they move during their, their employment uh, or during their careers. So they effectively withdraw money. So we saw um, towards the end of last year, some of the first sort of draft papers being published uh, and there's been some, some recent draft legislation, uh, what's called the two bucket system. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, interesting name, but really what it boils down to is it is basically, it's the mechanism that government proposes to, to really deal with basically two things simultaneously. 
and it is one it is to bring about you know improved retirement outcomes and it's really through pres preservation improved preservation in South Africa but simultaneously walking that tightrope between also giving members and employees ultimately some level, level of access to those funds when they do have typically life emergencies or crises during their working lifetime. So it's really trying to get that balance right. And it's obviously an incredibly difficult thing to get right, but I do think, and I don't know about Tembi, but the way they've gone about it seems to be a very evenly balanced and, and well-considered approach generally. What's yes. your assessment of what they've put on the table here? Because it is a, quite a tricky balancing act that you've got to get right uh, in order for this to work and be effective, not for the short term, but for the long term as well. Correct. So I, I do agree with Bram in that it is yeah, evenly balanced because I suppose National Treasury is responding to the calls because during the pandemic, people lost their jobs, people had reduced salaries and just needed extra income or to be able to access some form of income to tide them through. And currently, our, and during that time, our laws just didn't allow for it. And we saw different pension systems around the world, like in the USA and in Australia, where they allowed their members to access the, um, a portion of their retirement savings. So it's in response to that. But um, as Brahma also alluded to, being able to access your retirement saving has to go hand in hand with preservation. Yeah. So with the uh, two-part system, you will have the first part which is what they now in the draft re legislation are referring to as your savings pot. And that's there where you can be able to draw some money. They are proposing once every 12 months. And then there will be a, another pot, which is a retirement pot. And that is the preservation one that we can't touch. So that is my backpack that I'm going to carry through until retirement. Let's refine this a little bit, mm. Tim B. What are some of the key considerations to be kept in mind here as we see this evolution progress? So some of the key considerations is to, at the back of our minds, that retirement savings is really for that, to provide us with an income in retirement. But we cannot be oblivious or blind to the fact that people do struggle. So when you're going to tell me to contribute to a retirement fund, but I don't have enough money to come to work, you know, so we need to also just be cognizant of things like that. So the two-part system sort of kind of does deal with that, that yeah. there is a portion that I cannot access until I'm in retirement. So that is I'm going to use to give me an income in retirement. But there is this other savings portion. I don't have to access it if I don't have to, but to know that I can. There's a safety net of sorts. As TMB highlighted, we've got South Africa following on from global trend, Bram. So what are some of the lessons we should be extracting locally from those global experiences? Well, I think certainly two part, which really talks about preservation. And again, some of the things that preceded that, like T-Day, which brought about annuitization, a lot of what we've, those are examples, but a lot of the other changes we've seen as well in South Africa is really very much schooled or based on some of the international trends, uh, Alicia. So we do know governments and regulators now sort of talk with each other internationally to align uh, on, on some of these, these trends. I mean, some of the big things that, again, looking at, at what's sort of been driving uh, retirement you know, systems and changes internationally and that we st certainly still expect to see at some stage in South Africa, uh, would be things like, you know, we, we've now got, uh, you know, preservation coming in. But certainly I think the question that really sits, sits, still sits at the foremost of, of we do know National Treasury and others' minds are things around, you know, do you make retirement savings compulsory for all working employees? There's a softer version of that, which is sort of called auto-enrollment, which is, you know, people effectively defaulted to contribute, but they've got the option to switch out. You know, compulsion would be there's no option to switch out. Uh, and certainly seems some of the recent papers, you know, we've seen that that seems to be a key thing on, on our sort of legislators' minds. But we know it's ultimately modelled and based on, you know, some of the international experience we've seen in other systems. Um, you know, when and how that may come to fruition, we don't know. But, but that certainly is, is one of the big trends I think we... We, we, we do know is, is, is occupying yeah. the minds of, of, of the legislators in South Africa. I know we've underlined from a legislative perspective, a regulatory perspective, this two-bucket system that's coming into play and looks to be brought to the fore. Beyond that, 
When it comes to the structuring of these funds, what are some of the considerations being made on that level? Regulation 28, for example, whether you're um, ESG compliant or not, you know, how, how's that starting to impact the way funds are being structured right now? I think it's, it's already obviously regulation 828 mm. is not new per se, but what we have seen is you know, big changes within regulation 28 being made. And uh, certainly some of the underlying drivers to that, uh, again, is some international trends, Alicia. So, um, you know, the, you know it's, there's, there's three well-known uh, letters, ESG, mm -hmm. but, you know, it's a big issue, you know, and it's, again, driven by international trends, but, you know, getting more and more established in South Africa. And it really is driving not only the thinking, but the practicalities around how institutional investors you know, retirement funds and the industry obviously being one of the biggest investors in South Africa, how they invest their monies, uh, their monies or their funds and the considerations they have to apply in terms of considering various options. Um, I mean, some of the biggest ones would be uh, infrastructure funding. We know in South Africa that is a very big issue. Yeah, yes. because it influences, like Bram says, the the ambit of these investment funds at the end of the day. Yes, and just to uh, carry on from what Brahma is saying about the infrastructure, so with Regulation 28, the latest change was to provide a definition for that and to increase allocation to that. And that really comes from even from the governing party in their policy discussions mm -hmm. saying that pension funds in South Africa sit with over a trillion rands in assets. And we have a problem in that infrastructure needs to be rolled out and government doesn't really have the funding to do that. So now we have this opportunity to be able to use the pension funds assets to solve mm. some of the country's problems. And in doing so, I think that speaks to the S of the ESG, the social component, because I'm not only a pension fund member, but I'm a citizen of South Africa. And investment in infrastructure also benefits me, benefits my family. But obviously, um, in terms of structuring those investments, um, has to be done prudently, has to be done in a way that as pension fund asset owners, we feel that members are going to get a return on the investment and that the investment is safe. Yeah, because yes. up to this point, Tembe, we've been talking about the one side of the equation. On the other side of the equation, and I'm going to uh, reflect back because we've heard from our employer guests earlier, what trends are you starting to see in the workspace from employers when it comes to you know, the way they address some of the changes that we are seeing on a daily basis? So in terms of the employers, it's just more engagement with the members. So communicating to remind them that this is your retirement fund, these is the benefits that it offers you, and this is what you can do with it. So for example, um, during the pandemic, those uh, employers that did have like your income disability products, for example, members were able to claim for that when they had long COVID. So you don't have to worry about, mm. I'm sick, Am I still going to have my job when I come back because I'm recovering from long COVID? You could claim from a product like that, for an example. Bram, have we seen companies change their views on employee benefits and rewards and how they're approaching? I think we absolutely have. And again, listening to, to, to Andrew and Leber and just some of the examples that they gave in, in their companies. Um, I mean, we've certainly seen that across our, our customer base. Um, and, and I think some, some core themes come out. Obviously, I think how they play out in specific industries may be slightly different, depending on the nuances of the industry. But I mean, I think some of the themes are, you know, the need to, to really engage with, and I think you mentioned that, to really engage with employees. You know, employees really want to be spoken with, not spoken at or spoken to. Uh, the soft stuff really matter. The aspect of employee well-being. Um, and really just how do, you, how do employers look holistically after their, after their employees? I mean, that is just so critical. But the challenge is those things are often difficult for employers to get right. Uh, but I mean, again, there, there is help available you know, in the industry. There are you know, often packaged services or providers that, that help them with some of these things around, you know, from counseling or the likes. I mean, we provide it on some of our products, but I mean, they're quite commonly available. And we've just seen the, the need 
for those sorts of things have just uh, increased quite quite significantly. Tembi, I was going to ask you, are you seeing enough of that engagement and interaction happening between employer and employee where the employer does embrace a soft touch approach? Um, yes, it is picking up, uh, especially when employer employees as members are saying to the employer, listen, this is what I need. Can you help me? How can you help me? Yeah. You know, and with the return to work, we're seeing a lot of employers are, although not keeping fully to work from home, but the, adopting the hybrid model so that, you know, meeting uh, staff halfway that, yes, you've been working at home for the past two years, you don't have to come back to the office, but, you know, it is beneficial for um, team building and just collaboration and just to be with your colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, the social element of it all, right, Bram? Uh, do you see, Bram, that employers are cognizant enough and, you know, taking this listening to feedback, and we can say listen to feedback, but then there's really listening to feedback and engaging with product properly so that the outcomes are essentially what the employee wants at the end of the day? I think employers are. I think what's just got to be realistic as well. I mean, Alicia, I think we, we certainly saw many of our customers, you know, during the pandemic, for, for some of them, it was really a matter of survival. So, you know, our, our sort of mission was how do we work with, with our customers uh, to help them, you know, survive through the pandemic, uh, while certainly still trying to meet some of these changing employee needs. Uh, but I think now that, you know, hopefully the worst of the pandemic is over, I do think we're going to see an acceleration of that, where companies now really, you know, given the sort of probably permanently changed expectations of employees, we're going to see more companies now and having the bandwidth and perhaps the financial resources to more actively engage with that and say, you know, what does the new normal look like? And how do we really, how do we make it real for employees? But also, Bram, how do we as a business extract value from this at the end of the day? What's the value proposition for me as a business? Because it's not just about the employee and what they extract from this, right? Absolutely, and I, and I think the, you know, for, for, for a business, ultimately, you know, going back to the, to the central theme of, you know, your people, your human capital, I mean, that, for most businesses, that, that is the heart of your business. So, you know, ensuring that you have got a business that's motivated, where you can equip them with the, the skills, and I think increasingly what, what we're certainly seeing then or how it practically plays out is often a need for more flexibility, you know, again, specific targeting of propositions for not just a group of employees, but for individual employees within a business. In other words, how do you make it more relevant for the individual employee as opposed to the, the collective? We do see that as going to be increasingly an, an issue, and that's certainly something we're applying our minds to is how do we support and work with employers to make that real? Because if you can make that real and support the employer, and ultimately you've got a, a well sort of remunerated and a very satisfied employee, ultimately it's a win-win for everybody in the equation. Absolutely. Every time I have these conversations with you guys, I'm constantly reminded of just how critical human capital is within any organization, how important it is to value that human capital correctly and to be completely up to speed with some of the trends that are in play as well. Thank you both for having joined us in conversation this morning. It's been a pleasure catching up with you. And uh, of course, a quick thanks to each of my other guests today. We had Zandile, Lebu, Andrew joining in the conversation all before Bram and Tembi wrapped things up for us. Uh, so thanks to them for having shared valuable insights and perspectives with us today over such a brief period, might I add. And it really feels like we've covered so much today with so many uh, great ideas coming to the fore and solutions to consider in whatever business or operational area you might be. To our viewers today, a reminder, do post any questions you may have for our in-studio guests and we'll revert with a reply as soon as we can after this webinar. And then watch out for the future Leading Edge Insight Series Symposium scheduled for October the 31st at the Santon Convention Center. We'll be unpacking topics like these and so much more through a full day of sessions exploring how human capital and employee benefits can be a significant driver of growth in your business industry or sector. On behalf of the team at Liberty Corporate, once again, 
thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you all again in person in Santon late in October. Bye for now.